Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Plattner. I'm the co-editor of the Journal of Democracy and uh, vice president for research and studies here at the National Endowment for Democracy. I'm very pleased to welcome you uh, to this afternoon's panel celebrating the publication of Will China Democratize? Uh, here's the book. There are more copies in the back. Um, it's a Journal of Democracy book that was edited by Andrew J. Nathan, together with Larry Diamond and me. It was published by Johns Hopkins University Press this past fall. So our celebration is a bit late, first because Andy Nathan was spending the fall semester in Berlin, and second because a snowstorm wiped out our first try at holding this event in February. Uh, today the weather looks great, though, and uh, I hope that's a good omen for the success of our panel. And as we note in the introduction uh, to the book, the big question that scholars and political analysts have been asking for decades now is whether and for how long China can, can continue its impressive record of economic growth without undertaking political reform that would move it in a more democratic direction. The Journal of Democracy has been wrestling uh, with this question ever since its inaugural issue in January of 1990, which featured a set of essays on the crushing of the protests in Tiananmen Square. For almost 25 years now, we've been periodically trying to gauge the winds of democratic change in China, publishing both sets of essays and some standalone articles exploring different aspects of this question. And although most of the 30 pieces that are gathered in our volume are a fairly recent vintage, we've also included some older ones, uh, which we think express some points of view that deserve uh, getting a continued hearing. Now, the most recent articles in the book were first published in the January 13, the January 2013 uh, Journal of Democracy in a section that was titled, Is China at a Tipping Point? Andy Nathan uh, began the opening essay of that section by stating, quote, the consensus is stronger than at any time since the 1989 Tiananmen crisis that the resilience of the authoritarian regime in the PRC is approaching its limits. But an eventful year has passed in China since that issue of the journal was published with a new leadership in power, and there doesn't seem to be a great deal of evidence of new political reform or of new instability. <coughs> so we hope our panelists will consider whether and how the most recent developments may have changed their sense of the direction and timing of China's political trajectory. Now in this uh, connection, I want to quote a couple of power uh, paragraphs from a very powerful column uh, written last week by Timothy Gart Nash, who is by no means a China expert, but who does know quite a bit about the meltdown of communist regimes, uh, having written a great deal about the changes uh, in Europe. And here are his words. I'm going to quote at some length. Since the next few years are crunch time for the Chinese economy, the Chinese question is now sharply posed. It is no longer could evolutionary political reform, gradually increasing transparency, constitutional type balances, freedom of expression and civil society dynamism be used to complement and reinforce economic reform. Rather it is, can a reinvigorated party state harnessing in unprecedented fashion the energies of capitalism, patriotism, and older Chinese traditions succeed in mastering the ever more difficult challenges of continuing modernization. And I'm still quoting uh, Gart Nash now. And the answer is, question mark. And then he says, within the space of a few hours, I spoke to two of the most experienced foreign correspondents in China, both of them formidably well informed. Their diagnosis of the problems was almost identical, and their predictions spectacularly different. Mm -hmm. One thinks the party can still keep the show on the road 
with skillful management of state-led development. The other foresees economic meltdown, social revolt, and political upheaval. In short, nobody knows, but at least we should be clear about the question. So I'd also ask the panelists uh, to give us their sense of whether this is a useful way of framing uh, the issue, which Gart Nash uh, labels the Chinese question. Um, our panelists are a very distinguished trio with deep expertise on China. I'll introduce them only briefly since they're well known to the Washington community of China followers and you have fuller descriptions of them in your handouts. Andy Nathan, who's a co-editor of our volume and a member of both the Journal of Democracy editorial board and the National Endowment for Democracy's board of directors, uh, is the class of 1919 professor of political science at Columbia University. Min Chin Pei on my right, another JOD editorial board member and one of our most frequent contributors uh, about China, is a Tom and Margot Pritzker, 72 professor of government and director of the Keck Center for International and Strategic Studies at Claremont McKenna College. And Luisa Griva, who's contributed a chapter in the book on China's trouble periphery, is now Vice President for Programs here at NED after having spent many years directing NED's China portfolio. Before we begin, I want to recognize the Journal of Democracy staff for their excellent work, both in ed editing these articles when they first appeared in the journal and then preparing the book for publication. Uh, let me ask them to stand up when I mention their names. Phil Kostopoulos, is Phil here? Must be hard at work on a, a journal manuscript. Uh, in any case, he joined the journal at its inception, and he's been the principal manuscript editor of many of the essays in the book. Tracy Brown, in the back, um, has edited a number of the more recent uh, essays. Assistant editor Nate Grubman, who's away today, played an important role in assisting with the introduction. And our managing editor, Brent Calmer, who's here taking photos also, was instrumental in the production and design of both the initial articles and the subsequent book. And Brent and Tracy will have copies of the book for sale in the back of the room after the event for those might, who might be interested in purchasing a copy. And I also want to thank Melissa Ayton, Jessica Ludwig, Dean Jackson, and Marlena Papaveritis for their help in organizing today's session. Those of you who are on Twitter can follow this presentation and contribute to the conversation by using the hashtag NED, N-E-D, that is events, or by following the forum at Think Democracy and the endowment at NE Democracy. And now please join me in silencing your cell phones. Uh, our, the order of our speakers will be Andy Nathan first, Minchin Pei second, Luisa Grieva third. They'll speak for up to 15 minutes each, which should leave us plenty of time for questions and discussion. Uh, so Andy, please begin. <clears throat> Thanks, Mark. So as Mark said, the uh, Journal of Democracy was founded in 1990, and so those of us who've been involved with it have been scratching our heads for 24 years about what's going on in China and constantly swimming in this water of nobody knows. Um, and so Mark uh, and Larry Diamond decided to pull together this book and they asked me to participate. So I, they, I went over, Brent pulled together the 60 or so articles that have been published in those 24 years about uh, whether China would democratize. And I went through them all and picked about 30 that I recommended to my co-editors. And uh, we have such distinguished contributors in the book as the late Michael Oxenberg and the late Bob Scalapino, who I'm sure all of you uh, remember both of them and their work, Harry Harding, Wang Juntao, Perry Link, Xiao Chang, Rebecca McKinnon, and then the, the three of us on the panel and many, many others. And as I went over these articles uh, trying to pick some of them out. I mean, I was struck with the feeling that um, 
you know, that the, the authors all had very different prognoses. Some people felt that democracy was inevitable within a fixed period of time when the GDP reached a certain amount. Other people felt that it was inevitable because of rising social conflict and uh, loss of legitimacy. And then others placed emphasis on the strong reaction of the Chinese Communist Party to those challenges and its ability to be quick on its feet and adapt and stay in power. And as I was thinking about my remarks today and looking at the book again, I felt that what everybody had said in the book was all true. <laughs> Uh, all of these contradictory events uh, have been happening. And of course, w whenever I speak to Chinese and ask them, you know, trade ideas with them, they always tell me, you know, Zhongguo Han Fuzha, you know, it's complicated. <laughs> well, that's true. China is very big and it's very complicated. And so many contradictory trends are uh, taking place all at once. Uh, we usually throughout these articles, we kind of employ a sort of state and society framework. It comes naturally to Western social science, and we see uh, the society developing, the G GDP is going up, the middle class is growing, there are more uh, independent thought, more civil society, uh, more demands from below, so society is stronger. At the same time, the state is also stronger and more complex and more uh, diverse in its methods of dealing with social problems. So it's as if the, the contradiction between the two or the relationship between the two is just constantly being raised to a higher level without either side really getting the upper hand. So Mark, uh, I did write that sentence when I, a year ago that seemed, seemed very uh, you know, poetical at the time, and so he's impolitely pointing out that, <laughs> you know, what do you think now? So I, as I told Min Shin before we started the panel, I never change my opinion, but reality changes all the time. So I want to take stock of, uh, of what I'm seeing now. Uh, and I'm seeing a lot of uh, trouble. Uh, besetting the regime. I think that Xi Jinping gives a very, very good uh, act, if you will, of, of strength, stability, confidence. Uh, and he probably, as a person, really uh, has a lot of these feelings of confidence and determination. But as we look from the outside at the whole situation, we see the regime continuing to be besieged by a lot of problems. So I'm going to talk about four or five of those problems, beginning with Louisa's topic about the periphery. Um, and she'll say more about it. But the student demonstrations that have just been happening in Taiwan uh, really signaled, uh, reminded us of the degree to which uh, the, uh, the outer China, the parts of the People's Republic of China that are th that China claims or controls that are on the periphery, but they're not marginal, they're very big. The degree to which control over these pieces of territory is challenged and it's insecure. So what the students are basically telling us is we don't trust, you know, it's all about the internal politics of the KMT and procedures about some technical trade agreement. But what it's really signaling to us is that the people, a lot of people in Taiwan, probably most of the people even including the the KMT don't like Beijing. They don't want to be ruled by the Chinese Communist Party. And then in Hong Kong, there's trouble of the same kind, which is under the label of the Occupy Central movement, something that hasn't happened yet, but which the so-called pan-democratic camp is, is uh, planning and nurturing and using to try to threaten uh, the chief executive and the authorities in Beijing to allow uh, authentic elections for the next election of the chief executive and the legislative council comes before that in Hong Kong. And again, the signal is that Hong Kong is, is, is restless and that people in Hong Kong are not going to go smoothly along with what Beijing wants. And so these two things are added on top of the growing resistance in Tibet that we see signaled by this wave of self-immolations that the, the the police and the army in Tibet are not able to 
put an end to, and that's just the surface of a very deep disaffection that's widespread among Tibetans. <coughs> and in Xinjiang, <coughs> although I hesitate to call it terrorism, which is what Beijing calls it, but just a rising tide of resistance in Xinjiang that reflects, again, a, a failure of Beijing to really win the hearts and minds of the Uyghur population in that part of the country. And so <clears throat> these peripheral areas occupy a vast percentage, I haven't calculated it, but maybe 50% of the territory of the PRC and of huge strategic importance. So then uh, just thinking a little bit outside the boundaries of the PRC as well, although our main topic here is domestic politics, but just bringing in mind the neighborhood in which China is located, the, the China had spent some decades kind of reassuring its neighbors and trying to stabilize and institutionalize cooperative relationships with the neighbors around it, but its assertiveness is creating a lot of pushback from Southeast Asian countries, from Japan. So the, the, what's happening in Japan is kind of interactive, you know, the rise of a, of a, of a more nationalist Japanese leadership and sentiment in Japan is, is a response partly to the rise of China. Uh, uh, and the U.S. rebalance into Asia is also a reaction. So I'm not trying to say who's right and who's wrong. I'm not saying that China doesn't have core national interests around its periphery, but its, its neighborhood is very difficult for the Chinese leadership to sort of have a stable relationship with, and it's facing a lot of problems there. And then if we turn our eyes back to the interior of China, and we look at the, uh, the, the, the sort of China proper, if you will, or the Han heartland, the 94, 95 percent of the population that lives, uh, that are Han people who, who occupy the other sort of 50 percent of PRC territory, here we do indeed see uh, the rise of a middle class, we see uh, the government embracing and promoting urbanization, which uproots, uh, nobody knows how many, but maybe 100 million people off of the land. We see problems of land seizure. We see problems of, of pollution. We see demonstrations, the sort of not in my backyard kinds of demonstrations, such as the ones recently in Maoming against a a uh, PX plant, we see the, the continuing growth of religion, which is, you know, Christianity and many other, uh, and, and various, uh, Buddhism and various sort of native Chinese forms of Buddhism and Christianity sects, evil sects, as the government calls it, and, uh, and, and the assertiveness of these populations um, against government control, either trying to evade it or to, to resist it. And so, more and more very diverse forms of, of uh, assertion and resistance by all of these different social sectors against the government's attempts to uh, weigh one, to maintain stability. <clears throat> A fourth thing, that's, that's, I'm counting that as number three, and now number four thing that happens is that the government has been, has done something that's very smart in a way, which is to try to uh, the, the core regime, the, the Chinese Communist Party in Beijing, has has done a good job of trying to deal with all of these uh, so social struggles and pluralization of demands and interests in the Han heartland by, I would say, decentralizing uh, dispute resolution to various uh, away from the center, so that the center party state is not held responsible for every little tiny dispute that ever happens. And so one way to do that is to throw a lot of authority down to the local party secretaries and the, in the, in the municipalities and in the counties and in the townships. And another way to do that is to create specialized institutions whose job it is to resolve social conflict like courts and and the media as well have a lot of this function and uh, to create and allow public interest law firms and things of this kind. Um, 
but here again, the regime faces a very difficult problem of control because when they try to push away these powers into other institutions, those institutions take on a life of their own. And so you see the media, for example, saying, okay, if I'm gonna be the media and be a voice for the people, then I'm gonna investigate corruption, I'm gonna tell the truth, I'm gonna be a professional journalist, and you see lawyers doing that, and to some extent judges, although judges are under uh, very, very sharp uh, uh, career constraints, uh, trying to do their own job as as judges. And so there's a certain degree in which you can't have it both ways if you're the regime. You can't both uh, farm out these important social functions to other institutional actors and at the same time pull the strings of those institutional actors all the time because then they can't do their jobs. And so you have the sort of system running away from the leadership or threatening all the time to run away from the leadership. And to the extent that the system doesn't run away from the leadership and does allow its strings to be pulled, then it fails to perform its function and it, it doesn't have any credibility and it isn't able to actually do its job. And then a fifth thing that you have is the rise of civil society. And again, the government, and this is an unstoppable trend as a society becomes more urban, more educated. So that's the old fashioned modernization theory, which you know is still very, very valid and which many of our authors in the book draw on. And as, as people become wealthier, more educated, more urbanized and have property and have opinions of their own, they, they come together and they try to articulate for their own interests. And again, the party has been trying to sort of ride that wave, not to completely suppress civil society, but to proactively create some elements of civil society, again, like public interest law firms. Um, and, uh, uh, and uh, for example, a, a, a wave of government organized volunteerism <laughs> where they've, they uh, ha allow college students and youth to volunteer to do social service and go to the countryside and help the disadvantaged and things of this kind. So the government would like to shape uh, to, uh, this shape and, and sort of draw from this energy that society is putting out. But then it also has to but there's a tremendous amount of spontaneous organization, much of which the NED tries to help. And, uh, and that spontaneous organization, then the, the leadership has to decide which ones it can tolerate, not the leadership, but actually the, the political police down at that level really are the ones who have to decide what activities to tolerate and which ones are too dangerous. And one of, uh, one of the uh, groups that's that's very successful that way. Uh, I spoke to the head of it. I said, why haven't they arrested you? And his answer, I mean, there could be many answers to that. And one of the answers is that the work that his group does, which is to, to uh, carry out lawsuits and to help people with lawsuits against discrimination in employment and in education is actually part of the government's it's a constructive thing. It's something that the government likes. But on the other hand, having that process be done out of the control of the government and across provincial boundaries comes very close to the edge of what many people have been arrested for doing, like the Gungmung people, the Xu Jiuyuan people. And so his key answer was, they're so busy trying to find out what everybody is doing and trying to stop certain people from doing things that they just don't have time to get to us. Well, I don't know if that's really the right answer. Nobody ever really knows why somebody survives and somebody doesn't survive, but it's kind of interesting perspective on how you have to put out, you know, it's a vast, complicated country, put out fires all over the place, even though they have a humongous police system, there is only 24 hours, or there are only 24 hours in a day. So trouble with civil society. So, and then the final trouble that I wanna mention is trouble in the regime. So this is obviously very, very hidden. 
One of our contributors who puts a lot of emphasis on that is uh, Chung Lee of the Brookings Institution contributed an article in the, in the book <clears throat> where he talks about this. And we, we know from occasional flashes of lightning like the Boshi Lai incident that, you know, that there's a, always a powerful struggle going on in the regime. And it stands to reason abstractly that that would be the case because power within this regime is a is a huge power, and it's incredibly, uh, because it's an authoritarian regime and very centralized in, in character, that, that these are resources, the po high positions in the regime, I mean, maybe the top several thousand would be classified as very high positions in the regime that are just uh, infinitely valuable to the possessor. I mean, not just financially, but in every way, psychologically and uh, and in terms of, well, you know, whatever one values as an achievement in life. And so it's inevitable that there would be a, a, an intense struggle over these positions. And uh, what keeps that together has got to be in a fragile equilibrium, we have to say. Um, and uh, there's a wonderful article by an, 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 a scholar in China named Li Weidong, Li Weidong, who wrote an article about the mentality of Hong Si Di Guo Zhi Lu, the Red Empire. And he's sort of, it's like reading the mind of these elites. And Li Weidong says the mentality of these elites is, you know, our grandparents and parents seized power here. There's nobody more qualified than us to run this country. We're not going to let... Uh, our enemies, these sort of riffraff among the people and these foreign, you know, like Mark Platner type of people, <laughs> Carl Gershman type of people to, you know, to seize this empire from us, it's ours. And by gum, we're the ones that can uh, make something out of it. That's a, a very short summary of a very, very subtle and I think true argument. So that's what holds this, them together is you know against everybody else, but at the same time within themselves, I think their their unity is has got to be very fragile. Even though we don't see a lot of uh, of uh, you know evidence uh, sort of leaking out of the black the black star uh, to know how this really goes on. So to come back to Mark's question about you know what do I think now. <laughs> And what is the timing and trajectory? Uh, I, I still feel that this is a regime that is very, that is strong but fragile, like a piece of, uh, I don't know what, some kind of countertop that you might purchase at a very high price and then drop a cleaver on it and it just breaks apart. You know, it's very, very hard. But at the same time, it's in some kind of extremely dynamic tension. It's, the sense continues to be there of, of a sort of profound instability in the system. Even if you read the party's own 60 points that they published at the... You, it, Minchin's job is to disagree. So when he <coughs> nods like that, you know it's not true. He's, <laughs> but the party's own 60 points of the 18th, uh, the third plenum of the 18th Central Committee last fall, where they're constantly saying, we got to change this and got to change that and got to change the legal. Of course, it's, a lot of it is about economics, but got to change the legal system and got to change the, you know, the model of governance is what they're saying. Of course, the idea of how they want to change it is their idea is to perpetuate this red empire, to be sure. But it it does give off this flavor of... Of, of, of change has got to happen. You know, this is not it. We're not there yet. And so I think uh, most Chinese and most of us outside analysts have that feeling that we're not there yet. So that's the trajectory. But the timing remains, it seems to me, very, very, uh, I, I am not able to say what the timing would be. It could go on this way, it seems to me, for a long time. I don't have that feeling you know, that that uh, it, 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 it's happening right at this moment. So I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> Thank you for that confession. Uh, uh, but really, uh, for some fascinating remarks as well. Now I'll turn to Minchin. Okay. Well, 
uh, let me uh, reduce the amount of ambiguity in this room uh, <laughs> a little bit. Uh, uh, while I uh, agree with Andy's overall uncertainty about the exact timing and the exact uh, manners in which a transition can happen, I would say one thing probably Andy and I would agree on, and many of us would agree on that, answer to will China democratize will have to be a yes. But what we have a lot of uncertainty about is when and how. And on these two issues, I would try to uh, be a little bit more, uh, I would take a little bit more risks. I would say we, based on what we know about authoritarian regimes, how they fall, and based on what we know about the trajectories of transitions in the last 40 years, because this is the past 40 years, we've seen a lot of transitions, some 80 uh, transitions in the world. Probably this, the transition phase has to come in China, probably will be in the next 15 years, 10, 15 years. So this is the, uh, and why that's going to happen, I will explain. And how it's going to happen, again, based on what we, we've looked at, uh, there are only three ways countries become democratic. Of course, there is fourth way that they don't become democratic. But if they become democratic, there, there is a top-down managed transition. We've seen this in Mexico, Taiwan, Brazil, Spain, peaceful, gradual. There is a second way, which is revolution. The former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, the Arab Spring. And then there's a third way. Uh, which is somewhere in between, you have some, something called a runaway reform, that is a group of elites that start a process of gradual transition, but in the middle of this, they lose control over the process. That's the Gorbachev model. So uh, I've not seen a force model. So if transition is going to happen, so we can think about one of these three uh, ways of transitioning China. Uh, so this is the beginning. Now let me just uh, move back a little bit and say what, where China is today. Where China is today is like the Soviet Union circa 19, early 1980s. There are a lot of striking similar, similarities, but of course there are differences as well. Why would I say this? One of the documentaries produced by the Chinese Communist Party's propaganda department in association with five leading party institutions or academic institutions was a 20-year retrospective documentary on the fall of the Soviet Union. I wonder whether you, uh, you, you know about this. It was a required viewing for senior party leaders, mid-level party leaders. I would say the, uh, uh, why did they put this documentary out? You, you need to ask some questions. I've not seen this, uh, but I can guess that it is a very negative portrayal of the post-communist experience. We all know what Putin thinks about the fall of the Soviet Union, the greatest geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century. He has a lot of people in Beijing who would agree with him. Of course, they, they would not say this publicly. The Chinese Communist Party also believes that that was a huge political tragedy, not necessarily geopolitical tragedy. Why do they, at this moment, uh, f have such feelings about form former Soviet Union and its collapse? I would say that's closely connected with their own assessment of where they are. So wh where they are today, uh, I would say this is th the Chinese ruling elites are aware of the consequences of a decade, if not more, of political stagnation inside the system, concealed by superficial economic success. And they are also aware of the corrosive effects of corruption of the party state itself. Uh, and certainly they are also aware of the rising opposition from Chinese society as a result of the forces and they mentioned. And the rising opposition of Chinese society makes 
the, tra the strategy of adapting to change that party has adopted after 1984, 1989, decreasingly effective. And they have to increasingly rely on repression to maintain power. So as a result, the party, I would say in the uh, last two years, was having a, an internal debate about what to do. And the result of that was this incoherent, logically, inco politically incoherent document produced at the 18th Party Grand Congress. It declared a goal, a vague goal. It outlined some specific policies, but as a political document, it makes absolutely no sense. Because you, will, you would ask, how, how can the party chop off its own grabbing hand. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is actually a gruesome image uh, the Chinese officials use, that a, heroic, well, uh, a hero would chop off his own arms or uh, his hand. So in other words, how can the party deal with all those internal, external challenges without changing the fundamental methods of governing? So this is the, the background. I would say if you, now when you look forward and say why this is going to happen, there are two fundamental drivers for political change. One originates in Chinese society in the modernization process, in social change. We all know what they are. And these changes, based on, again, international experience, set a limit at which authoritarian regimes will find themselves very difficult to survive if they are not oil producing regime, uh, societies. So uh, I don't want to bore you with data, but we can go to the numbers later on. Uh, we have generational change. I asked my RA to uh, do a little research. Half of the Chinese population today are born after 1976. Why that is important? One of the source of legitimacy or one of the desires uh, of the Chinese population is this yearning for stability. Most people like us would have been traumatized by the Cultural Revolution, by the Maoist rule. So stability is something that has enormous value for people of my generation and of the other half. But half of the people in China, for some, the Cultural Revolution is an abstract term. And the call for stability will be decreasingly uh, uh, persuasive. And uh, they have far more individualistic traits based on opinion polls, uh, even though we do not know how fervently pro-democracy they are. Uh, and the other number I cite all the time is that society is producing elites at a level that at a speed that the current system simply cannot co-opt. Because one part of the, co the strategy of the Chinese Communist Party post-1989 was to co-opt social elites into the party, but Chinese, the Chinese modernization process is produce, producing 7 million college graduates a year. The party can only recruit, this is my favorite number, 1 million party members with college education. So it leaves out 6 million. Uh, we, uh, not all of them will be unhappy, but all we need is 1% of them to be unhappy, and you have a pretty big uh, group of people. Uh, and then the other driver, and I'm not going to talk, talk about urbanization and technological change. The other driver is internal decay of the system. The system decays because it no longer has ideological values that would provide coherence, vision, uh, identity, political identity for the system, and as a result, the entire regime has degenerated simply into a pers personal loyalty-based patronage system. When you look at p corruption cases exposed in China, and you trace who gets promoted into what, it's all based on personal ties. The unfolding scandal of Zhou Yongkang, I'm glad uh, Andy didn't mention this case, and this is a mega, sca uh, mega scandal. And when you look, the, the people he promoted into various positions and uh, what kind of crimes they committed, this is uh, uh, actually a uh, uh, perfect uh, diagnosis of 
institutional decay inside the system. Uh, and, and on top of that, uh, the elites themselves are decreasingly sure or secure about their future. This is, uh, you can look at this, uh, uh, again, the, uh, the efforts uh, they've taken to uh, send their money abroad, to send their uh, wives, uh, wife abroad, <laughs> send their kids abroad. So this is, uh, that's why these two drivers, you would say, how long uh, will the system uh, survive? As, as long as these two drivers are robust, I would say the system at some point will, uh, 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 will not just be uh, brittle, but will crumble. So why timing and uh, the exact way in which transition will, occur will be difficult? I would say the answer is the leg it's all about psychology. Uh, and before I go into this, I want to cite this a quote. Uh, Trotsky, Leon Trotsky says something very famous, is that before a dictatorship is overthrown, its overthrow was seen as impossible. After it is overthrown, its fall is always seen as inevitable. So why that, why that is the case? I think when you look at the collapse of Soviet Union, Mubarak, where, uh, or Suharto, before they fell from power, we said, the same things we're saying about China was said in, before these events happened. And then, after these events happened, we said we were wrong, and we tried to find <coughs> justifications. That's because uh, the loss of legitimacy and the erosion of inner strength of uh, an authoritarian regime is ge geometric, not linear. We are accustomed to linear thinking. We say it is, if this, is, this regime is this strong today, probably it will be this strong tomorrow. It doesn't happen that way. If it's strong today, it can be very weak tomorrow. Because the basis of rule of authoritarian regime is one simple fact. It is fear. It is psychological. It is not material. It is not physical. When you look at, Mubar when you look at the Mubarak regime the day before he fell and the day after he fell, what changed was psychology. Nothing about the capacity of the police force, the military, the secret police changed. It's all about this psychology. So psychological shift can happen very, very quickly. That's why I would say if change does not come from the top, and if change has to come from within Chinese society, and that kind of change will happen very, very fast. So that, uh, on that happy note, <laughs> uh, uh, let me repeat that the future for democracy in China actually is not as bleak as we normally think. Uh, thank you. I have some questions to ask about that, but first let's uh, hear from Louisa. Thank you, Mark. Well, I will agree with my fellow panelists that the troubles are mounting, but I cannot agree that the more the troubles mount, the more we think democracy is coming. Uh, change does not always lead to democracy. So it, just to add to the points about uh, the troubles mounting, I wanted to do a quick tour of the, the periphery where uh, I agree the crackdowns and the alienation and trouble are mounting. Tibet is worse off than the year ago when we had our, our panel about the cluster uh, of articles. Uh, the self-immolations have actually uh, abated in pace, but uh, par in part because the crackdown is harsher. The government has uh, punished family members, and this may be some incentive for people who are willing to give up their own lives, but not those of their families or to endanger their entire families. And the tensions are, are uh, as high as ever. Negotiations are not on the table for a peaceful resolution of that kind of a national conflict. And in Xinjiang, absolutely things are worse. Uh, getting worse and, and the incidents, uh, the Beijing Jeep incident, in, I mean, the, the Tiananmen incident with the Jeep, and certainly the Kunming incident with the terrible knife attack uh, in the train station in Kunming in March uh, have both only inflamed uh, tension and given rise to a government determination to use force to crack down. And of course, the arrest of this very moderate uh, and distinguished scholar, Ilham Tohti, who was teaching in Beijing, uh, the arrest on January 15th, and then 
the charge on February 26th of separatism and recruiting terrorists to his separatist cause through his online uh, website where he tried to discuss the public policy issues affecting the future of Xinjiang and the Uyghur people, uh, a terrible sign. So even the announcement that the Public Security Bureau budget for Xinjiang would be doubled in this, this year's budget is all a sign of the need to address troubles, uh, but then to trouble, address them in a way that, frankly, continues to sow the seeds of future trouble. So this is not a, a, a sign of a, of a new regime coming in and a new uh, premier who says, let me take a new tack in a way that will allow me to solve these troubles. It's just more of the same uh, around the periphery and using old tactics to simply try to tamp down things that challenge stability and seem to threaten the survival uh, of the regime. And then Hong Kong also, clearly this is not being handled in a way that uh, helps to promote a stable basis going forward and rather uh, continuing to refuse to acknowledge the and f fulfill the promise of full democracy for Hong Kong. The, tr the commitments made in the Sino-British Agreement, we had an event last week on Hong Kong where we heard very eloquently from both Martin Lee, the longtime vocal advocate of democracy in Hong Kong, and Anson Chan, who for a long time was not a vocal advocate uh, of pushing forward as rapidly as possible and ensuring the democratic uh, constitution of the government and full universal suffrage in Hong Kong, which he's now speaking out. They came to Washington to sound the alarm, as they said. So there's definitely trouble on the periphery there. And another periphery, I agree with you, uh, with your image, Andy, to call the, the uh, particularly the intellectuals, the professionals, uh, and the advocates of rights, broadly, uh, the new citizens movement within China, that's a periphery within the country. There, this regime, this uh, administration has made it clear that there's not to be a, any kind of a new tack but rather, in fact, to uh, have arrest and silencing as a tactic. All the media tactics as well, but uh, the arrest of Xu Jiyong and his four-year sentence and on and on, including some new tactics that are, are, are new but more, even more troubling. And people are talking about a throwback to cultural revolution tactics when you have the big V, you know, verified uh, popular commentators on Weibo, people who had a, a lot of followers who had to confess in public uh, that of their, their crimes, uh, their mistakes that they had made and, and expressed their repentance on television before the camera, which is something new under this administration. So I, I would say in terms of finding tactics to deal with these peripheries, uh, you know, a vocal opposition and then the periphery, peripheral areas that have already clearly disaffected. Um, there's nothing there that would indicate a, a move to a different way of resolving problems. And um, you know, certainly for them, the Chinese dream is, is for them a nightmare, um, easily stated. So we don't see a top-down reform agenda, certainly in those areas. And also no success at squelching the bottom-up demands either. So people do continue to demand their rights uh, and to protest when their land is, is uh, confiscated and to express their outrage at the corruption, uh, to vote with their feet when they can. And so in that sense, we can say there's no change in this either, which is that the grassroots demand, the, the social changes and the ability to vocalize uh, demands of the government have not changed. And so this is always a constant that you say, no matter how things get in terms of mistrust, in terms of uh, a government's growing determination not to ever allow Western-style uh, multi-party democracy, which is anathema to the stability and future of China. Nonetheless, the people, people, ordinary people, still expect a good government. They expect good governance, not just the economic growth, but the other elements of good governance. So they, in some sense, this traditional uh, culture, they expect upright officials. And no matter how many decades of having seen brutality and corruption and misuse and self-dealing, they nonetheless have not given up that ideal. They don't say this is the way the world is. They say they still, we Chinese should have an empire of upright officials. So the expectation is still there, uh, and yet it's constantly uh, violated their expectations. And in fact, the cumulative effect here 
just bodes for a future of continued unfulfilled demands if you can't feed your babies the milk powder because you're concerned about adulteration you can't even eat food because you're afraid of heavy metals in the land that grows your vegetables and and you know feeds the pigs you can't breathe the air because of the pollution certainly the pressures for change mount so troubles mount and troubles mount so i'm going to agree with you all of on on all of that but dissatisfaction with bad governance and with authoritarian misrule does not create uh, democracy. It could uh, destabilize a regime, but what direction um, does the country then take? And so I don't want to say that I'm disagreeing with those who say you get chaos or one uh, without the Communist Party, but for all, all of us who are happy to see that people are able to express themselves and that they demand more than what this government delivers, nonetheless we have to ask ourselves, where would truly reformed institutions come from? Um, is it coming top down? No, we don't have any vocal, any signs of an organized group within the party. We don't see enough of an organized group uh, outside the party in independent civil society. They're, they're struggling for survival. They're still simply trying to assert, assert standards of, of civilized governance. Um, but where is the institution? Where are the, where are the political forces that are willing to take China into a new direction? Um, you know. That it has to be there. Uh, Minxin, you know, you, you might say Mubarak couldn't hold on and um, the USSR R couldn't survive, but that didn't lead to democracy either. So I'm uh, unfortunately quite pessimistic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louisa. Uh, I would say there seems to be more consensus on the panel than uh, I had expected. I guess the question I wanted to ask Minxin, but then is really for everyone. You mentioned these three routes to uh, transition, and but you also mentioned it might not happen at all. But top-down managed transition, revolution, and runaway reform, which is a result of an effort initially at a, a top-down managed transition. Am I right in saying that you've eliminated the prospect of one in three? So. We're left with revolution, and that seemed to be, in a way, what Louisa was suggesting. And I don't know how uh, what Andy would say about that. But this is what struck me by the Tim Garton Ash quote that I read at the beginning. He says the question no longer is, but it used to be. You know, could there be evolutionary political reform, gradually increasing transparency? Uh, constitutional uh, balances, additional freedom, and so on. And one could envisage then the regime trying to make this transition. But now the suggestion is that that's not something that's really in the cards. So it's the, the issue becomes, can the reinvigorated party state succeed in clamping down while keeping the economic growth going. So let me ask you first. To respond. Yeah, uh, the top-down managed reform has more likelihood of success if it occurs sooner rather than later. When you look at Taiwan, Mexico, they all began the process much sooner. And, but there's also one huge difference. The Chinese system is post-totalitarian. Other success stories were authoritarian. We are talking about two different beasts. And two to date, not a single post-totalitarian system has managed to reform itself. So that this historical record against that one. Why that's the case, uh, we don't have time to go into this. The second one is that you actually need to learn the right lessons from history. The Chinese Communist Party has learned the wrong lesson from history. The wrong lesson is that Gorbachev reformed the Soviet Union, politically, and that led to the destruction of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. What they did not know is, was the 15-year Brezhnev, or 17-year political stagnation on the Brezhnev. So that, that lesson, the wrong lesson, lead to, need to be unlearned. Hmm. <laughs> uh, and the third one is there's always this paradox that is, Regimes who think they are strong enough to survive through repression, they have no willingness, propensity to reform. 
And so regimes that can reform would not reform. And regimes that want to reform, typically they do so when they're really weak, when problems are tremendous. So the, the moment they start opening up, they have what I would call the, the Tocqueville paradox. That is, this is actually the, uh, something the Chinese leadership has been learned, uh, sort of educated. That is, you should not open up when you are weak. Thank you. Luis or Andy want to add a word? I want to ask a, a question to mention along this line. So we, we don't maybe spend enough time thinking about your fourth option, what it would look like, because the fourth- Stagnation. But the, okay, well, yes. It's rotting. <laughs> okay, but let me ask whether the fourth, it's hard to believe that in the fourth option, things would just stay the same forever. There's gotta yeah. be change. Yes. In the fourth option, even the fourth even the option is, is some kind of change. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we don't spend much time. So, so the fourth option probably has four options under it, you know, <laughs> and, and one well, of them might be stagnation, but probably the, the thing that the regime itself is aiming for is a... Singapore in China. Okay, yeah. Singapore in China. So we need to think about what that is. <laughs> sort of a... Uh, 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 so we need a kind of Hegelian uh, synthesis of democracy and authoritarian, a new kind of authoritarianism, which is more uh, consultative, more legitimate, more uh, agile, more successful more like a democracy, but not a democracy. That's what we, we need to, that's probably what they have in mind, is we'll stay in power, we'll uh, uh, create uh, more uh, we'll, we'll, uh, consultation with civil society, more co-optation, more compromise, but nothing that touches upon our monopoly of power. Is that impossible? You might say, well, it never existed before. I don't know if it has or not, but even if it hasn't, so therefore, that's uh, not an answer. Well, so far, I think the, uh, one of the things they've done is to send party secretaries sweeping streets. <laughs> that uh, does it. That right. does it. Yeah, we need all of them, <laughs> the sweeping streets. Uh, okay, why don't we open it up to uh, questions from the floor. I'll start with Carl Gershwin, but uh, who needn't identify himself, but if everyone else would please do so. Yes, uh, I would appreciate it. Thanks, uh, and welcome. Uh, I, I want my first uh, point has to do with the psychological dimension, Minjin, that you that you mentioned. You said that uh, you know there was a lead in security at the same time. Then you quoted Trotsky that everybody says it's impossible before it happens. I mean, it has to be one way or the other. If they're all so deeply insecure, sending their families and their money abroad, then they don't think it's impossible. Uh, they can't think it's impossible. Second, regarding that insecurity or I mean, the psychological dimension, neither of you talked about really the international dimension. Andy, you did a little bit about the neighborhood, but, uh, you know, Hegel has just been over there, uh, the other Hegel. <laughs> and this, this, is, this is not nine, the late 1980s, you know, with the, you know, U.S. seemingly on the rise, everybody feeling democracy is inevitable. This is a period of, all right, early, but still Gorbachev was late. And that was a time when you had Reagan, when you had an America which was confident. You don't have that today. So you could argue that the psychological edge, if you include the international dimension, and I would sort of like both of you to talk about that international dimension, um, they may have the edge on that because certainly there's deep pessimism in the West, and you know this. And th this is in addition to the financial crisis of, of five years ago. And finally, the last point, which I'd like you to address, you know, I mean, Louisa talks about the periphery, but Russia was the Soviet Union, excuse me, was very, very different. Fifty percent of the population was non-Russian. Here you have seven percent of the population being non-Han Chinese, and that empire dimension of the Soviet Union was a deep vulnerability which you don't have today. I mean, you may have a few problems on the periphery, but this is nothing like what uh, the Soviet Union had. And in a way, there, there were people in Russia that wanted to be freed of that uh, burden of empire. There 
is no other mic on. Hi, I'm a PhD uh, from Andrew Nathan was on my PhD committee, so I, I'm going to be I'm going to betray his faith in me, however, by supporting Pei Min Shin today uh, in my question in my uh, <laughs> 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 my question really is because Carl's here too. Could I please be allowed to write an article for the Journal of Democracy? Uh, <laughs> because if I were so allowed. I would criticize the the 60 articles that you pan picked 30 from for this book, and say there's really there was an intelligence failure in some of these articles. And these uh, the wonderful book by Bob Jervis, also a Columbia PhD, called Intelligence Failure. And Jervis spent a year inside CIA as a guest professor, and, and he lays out when intelligence failure happens, can you learn something from it later? So if Professor Nathan just says all these trends are contradictory, but they're all there and that he's confused, he loses the chance for all of us to learn lessons from failures among some of these 60 articles. One of the failures, I believe, is to ignore both the strength and the views of the hawks in China, for lack of a better term. They use the term themselves, Ying Pai. They came out quite recently, and, and I helped Jane Perlez do a nice story on it in the New York Times, which I recommend to you. They came out recently in a piece even stronger than what Pei Min Xin mentioned. Uh, this is called Zhao Liang Wu Sheng, The Silent Contest. It's 90 minutes long. Uh, many of the PLA generals I've known and loved over 40 years come out on camera. And they attack the NED. They say that Gorbachev was a fool, manipulated by both NED and CIA and other forces. And they show Gorbachev on camera several times. Then they, sh then they show the NED. So it's particularly difficult for the NED to, to understand, and sort of the Heisenberg's principle, what is happening to democracy in China. When what I submit is a very powerful force the hawks, the anti-democracy hawks in China, the PLA, the security services, some parts of the party, not all. Uh, when they are demonizing the Americans as the real source of a democratic change in China, it behooves NED and the Journal of Democracy to take very, very seriously this Chinese authentic assessment of why we need to fight hard in China against a certain kind of democracy and push another kind of democracy. Uh, Yu Keping and better governance, they've got the World Bank on board with them. So it, uh, this is a long question, but I, my big question was, can I please write an article in the Journal of Democracy? But the subset is, why, Andy Nathan, why do you ignore this powerful critique of the hawks in China of both the NED and the second part of it is Zhao Ziyang, uh, Ruan Ming, Yan Jiaqi. They have a very detailed reconstruction of what happened April 17, 1989. Zhao Ziyang had lost, as you show to some degree in the Tiananmen Papers. He lost. What did he do? Did he say, OK, I obey the party consensus? No. He went to the streets. His teams went out with posters. They activated students at Beida. They started the movement. Now, if that's true, it means there's a fourth model beyond what Pei Min Xin is saying. It's sort of like the top-down model, but not quite. It means when a very senior Politburo debate breaks out, the losers always have the option of going to the streets. Now, at that time, Jim Lilly says, we never helped them. He didn't know. When Lord didn't know, he didn't know. They've talked about this online in a long video at the USCC uh, testimony back in 01. They learned only later of the split in the Politburo that went to the streets to try to have Madisonian-style democracy, if you believe Yen, Cha, Yen Jia Chi's book, which you're the editor and translator of. So, why ignore this split in the Politburo, support from abroad, that the Chinese hawks claim 
is what they're most afraid of and they're most dedicated to blocking. And they see the NED as part of this, directed, of course, by the U.S. government's own black hand. That's my question. Yes, can I please publish an article? I believe this, this is a question you've posed for, to me before, uh, Michael, and uh, my answer now, as it is then, is send us a manuscript and we'll <laughs> take a look. So. Bureaucratism. <laughs> Publish it without the damn manuscript. <laughs> <laughs> Since those were longish questions, maybe we should uh, first see if anyone wants to respond to those. But I think that Carl's and Mike's question definitely overlap a lot because, yeah, I, I agree. First of all, I didn't, the book that I edited, probably you're thinking of the Tiananmen Papers, not Yen Jia Chi's book, right? Just, no, I didn't do Yen Jia Chi's book. You have he an wasn't intelligence. Columbia, but that, that I don't know. Maybe I did. <laughs> <laughs> how, can I re, how can I remember? Okay. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> just this one. And, um, okay. But I think, yes, this sense of siege on the part of, uh, of a large part of the leadership, yeah, I think that's very, very true. And Scobell and I published an article in Foreign Affairs about that, so, you know, but. Uh, uh, so, and I think it overlaps with part of Carl's question, which is I think that is a source of support. And that is to say, uh, the sense of siege actually helps the regime stay in power. You said that, but I think, you know, it's it's complicated, as I said before, and I think part of it is that they look at the U.S. as having a, a multiple fingers and different, many, many different tracks to undermine. So in this movie, Zhao Liang Usheng, the, the uh, silent conflict, where uh, they, they talk about, so this is a movie produced by the political department of the PLA, or the National Defense University or something, you know, uh, so it's an army view, a, a military view. And um, one of the things they say is that the U.S. is trying to foist mill-to-mill -mill contacts on the Chinese military as a way of undermining the loyalty of Chinese military officers to China. That's an amazing concept. Are, are your officers so susceptible that just mill to mill a little trip on an American aircraft carrier is going to turn these guys? I mean, you know, did it turn Hegel? That's real dialectics. <laughs> so, so I think, <laughs> so I think that, and then, then comes in your part of it, which is that the ability of the regime to stand up to uh, these uh, subversive attempts and the uh, American-Japan alliance and America's, uh, some people say, stirring up the Vietnamese and Philippines to undermine their natural friendship with China. That's one view. The other view is the Philippines and the Vietnamese are manipulating the stupid Americans mm -hmm. to whatever. So, so I think it, it does both things. It, it does strengthen the regime and uh, the uh, the fact that they can stand up to the American is the main main point. Right. Well, now you've mentioned uh, NED and its nefarious programs, according to these critics. Um, what does it say when not only conspiracy theorists on the internet, but you know the military filmmakers in China um, state what a threat NED is to China? One, it's a compliment. Two, it's <laughs> uh, false. And two, it's really not about the scope of NED programming, which is quite small. Everybody can look at the programs that we do have for China, which are all on our website. So if anyone says they've revealed or exposed what the programming of NED is, they, expo you know, they exposed it by going to our website and downloading the information. Um, but it's really a tribute to the, the, they're scared of the values and the standards, not of what NED is doing. I really think that's the case. Um, in the case of terrorism in Xinjiang, it's forces bringing in extremism, extremist ideology or encouraging and recruiting and training people. And truly, 
it's really, it is a, an insult to their own security forces if this really is happening under their very noses. It's the ideas that are coming, not the actual instruments, the people, the money, the books, uh, and, the, and the materials. So in that sense, yes, the, the legitimacy, the, their legitimacy is undermined by the contradiction between the stated goals of a civilized society and what they've been able to deliver, and that is threatening to them. Now, who could deliver a, a society rule, you know, govern according to those standards? That's my, still my question, but it's true. It's the standards that are threatening, not, not our programs. In terms of Chinese confidence, uh, it's quite schizophrenic. That is, one moment they feel very overconfident, one, another moment they feel overly insecure. And uh, their views of the West. Here, I would say their views of the US, because the Europeans actually don't matter a great deal to them, uh, for good reason. Uh, <laughs> but their views of, of the US, uh, uh, there was a debate in China uh, a few years ago about whether the US was a decline, China was rise, and that moment, uh, at that point, the consensus was the US was in decline. But I think today the consensus is that the US has come back, and China is facing actually far serious challenges and problems than the US. So this is, uh, uh, then uh, I would say you did point out this ethnic, the ethnic dimension is fundamental uh, in terms of the difference between China and the former Soviet Union. Uh, and that is, of course, part of the resilience of the uh, system. Uh, going forward, there are three things that are truly uh, worrisome for people who try to work out a scenario of regime transition. One is the role of nationalism. That is, it's, it's, it's an asset, political asset, for the current regime. We do not know is how successful uh, or the effect of milking national, manipulating national sentiments for maintaining power. So th this is a strategy that the current system has, has been, uh, the current regime has been deployed with considerable success over 20 years. The second one is that the, uh, because of the relative ethnic homo homogeneity of uh, the Chinese nation, the ethnic dimension, the, ethnic, the shock, the political shock from ethnic secessionist movement will be practically non-existent outside Xinjiang or Tibet. Uh, the third one is actually the military. The, uh, I'm glad that Mike talked about the military. The new leadership clearly is far more focused on reasserting the party control over the military. And you see the rhetoric, the term is regime security, This is something that, this is a phrase that you don't actually hear openly thrown around in the Chinese press. This actually has been in the press, in the Chinese press. And the PLA is supposed to defend regime security rather than national security. So the support of the military, that is another. So in a crisis moment, but now going back to elites, I would say any of these scenarios, the three scenarios, a div division at the very top of the elite and division throughout the system uh, within the regime is a prerequisite. If you have the majority of the elites believing in one cause, agreeing on one cause of uh, action, then the system can stay in place. But this is the fourth option, where like, uh, the system stays in power, but society rots. <laughs> <coughs> uh. Take John, and then there is one here and one in the back. Jerry? Well, now that we've brought up Hegel, I have to bring up economic determinism. It's essential. Introduce yourself. John, John Sullivan with the Center for International Private Enterprise, one of the institutes of the NED, and part of the US Chamber of Commerce, hence my interest in the economy. Uh, it does seem to me that that's one dimension which was perhaps not as, as uh, fulsomely addressed as it could be. So let me give you the opportunity. Um, one of the challenges that China is facing right now is how to modernize and maintain the growth rate that it's got. They've, as many of the articles in the journal, uh, in the collection there, talk about China has 
for the last several years since the collapse of Len Marxist Leninism has been really functioning on a performance legitimacy kind of function. And I know Min Jin thinks this. We've we've talked this about this many times. Now, whether you're talking to the people at uh, in Wall Street or you're talking to the academics, uh, whatever community you talk to, nobody knows for sure whether there's a Chinese bubble. But for sure we know one thing, and that is that for China to continue the economic growth rate, the job creation levels that they've gotten, and clean up this fundamental pollution that uh, Louisa has talked about, which is just horrific. It's gotten to the point now where it's drifting across the Pacific and infecting us, and that's intolerable, of course. But uh, seriously, the, the, the levels of pollution are, are really quite, quite serious to the point where they're threatening the economic viability of the Chinese model. So if you could just address the Chinese model, and I don't expect you to say whether or not there really is a bubble in China. If you do, I'll be sure to head off to my broker uh, immediately after this. Hi, um, my question is towards oh, uh, Anastasia Mark with uh, PPI, the Progressive Policy Institute. Um, and my question is regarding what um, you all think the American role might be in encouraging what we would see as positive development in this area in China. And just kind of towards that point, I've spent a fair amount of time in China and I commented to one of my Chinese friends once about how no one ever talks about politics. And they said, no, they just don't talk about it in front of you. Right? It's all mianza, right? They don't want to have these kinds of debates in front of foreigners. And sometimes I get the impression that State, for example, if Nancy Pelosi takes an interest in Tibet, or if American politicians at a very high level criticize, it actually galvanizes top-level leadership and brings more unity to one of the areas of weakness you all have identified. So I was wondering if you would have any thoughts on what American leadership or uh, institutions could do to, besides NED, although also yourself, um, to en encourage democracy in China. Thank you. Uh, Jerry Hyman at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Um, thank you. Th so there's this parade of problems uh, that you've all uh, laid out. And uh, Luisa's comment aside, which is maybe it'll collapse, but it might not be democratic. The, the theme seems to be, well, collapse is pretty, is, is in the cards. So there's corruption, financial failure, unfulfilled aspirations, lower standards of living, unemployment, protests, environment. Um, and if you ask yourself uh, that, if, if you look at that set, it seems to me you could be describing the United States pretty easily. And so my question is to sharpen the, the issue if you think that really there is a potential crisis. What, what is it in ch that's uh, different in China than in, let's say, the United States, unless you're also predicting collapse in the United States, which would be an interesting discussion for another day. Um, is it worse? Are these problems worse there? Is it that there's little flex? All these things have been mentioned. So just wondered if we could sharpen it a bit. Is it less flexibility? You know, the bamboo is no longer bending in the wind. Is it that there's no, too little legitimacy outside of perform the performance legitimacy, which these would undermine? Is it elite division? Where is it that it creates this um, potential for collapse? in China that isn't, won't happen in some of the other countries, Europe, the United States, Japan, et cetera, which also uh, suffer from a lot of these same kinds of problems. Uh, my name is Yashui Cao. I run the uh, website uh, ChinaChange.org. Um, it's a website that uh, uh, translates and reports on the uh, information about uh, China's uh, opposition movement. Okay. Uh, so I want to uh, contribute a note. He can't be here. He's one of the author, and he uh, his name is uh, Zhao Hui, Mo Zhixu. Uh, uh, his article is uh, collected here in this book, so I thought it's nice to, <laughs> uh, for me to quote him. 
uh, he, uh, I think it's the one with the t title with the word the contestation, something like that. <laughs> yeah, right. And I had a G talk with him the other day. I said, oh, we're going to have this, uh, this uh, event uh, celebrating uh, the publication of the book. And he proudly told me, he said, uh, listen, uh, this, uh, I'm, my voice is the only voice that came in from inside China. I said, okay, I'll be sure to tell them that. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> uh, so he is uh, 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 what we call the 1989ers. So he's that generation in his 40s as a long time uh, uh, dissident intellectual and he observes a lot of things. But anyway, uh, so this, oh God, my quote. Uh, this is uh, in light of the recent uh, Mao Ming uh, protest, this environmental anti PX uh, protest. Now, Mo Jushu uh, made a comment. He said, this is very recent, he said, uh, uh, once uh, the economic and uh, economy and society, uh, big changes uh, happen, occur to uh, the economy and the society, all sorts of uh, uh, suppressed uh, appeals uh, will likely explode at the same time. Uh, the seriousness of the situation uh, would uh, likely surpass our imagination. Uh, perhaps all of, us, all of us are just helplessly waiting for this moment to come. Uh, the stability maintenance system is strong but also brittle. It's uh, effective but it's uh, even more dangerous. So this is what he said. Uh, I think this is uh, from my uh, knowing him for a while, translated him too. I think uh, uh, that's his reading of what's happening. So my question for you is, do you guys envision this, this day? This, the United States, is the United States getting ready or having some uh, strategy for this? Okay. The second question is, I want to uh, pick up a little bit on Professor uh, Nathan's uh, um, comment about uh, the uh, uh, communist, the princelings basically perceive the country as their own property. You know, their grandfather, their father fought for it. It's their family business. Now, the question is, uh, how this, oh, we know it's not a one princeling and this whole bunch. How uh, going forward, especially after Xi Jinping, if he's able to stay to the end of his term, um, how this uh, internal power will pan out? I mean, I'm sure there's a, because uh, it's not a Mao's generation anymore, where Mao is this uh, authoritative figure. Not anyone, no one has that kind of uh, authority anymore. So everybody thinks we are equal. I mean, Xi Jinping is Xi Zhongxun's son. If Xi Zhongxun's son can be the president, why can't I, you know? So I, I can see this coming. I just, uh, uh, again, I just want to hear your comments. Thank you. Anne-Marie Brady, University of Canterbury and Wilson Centre. I, I, I want to suggest a fifth scenario, which I'm surprised has been ignored. Perhaps it's because we're in the United States, but coming from a Commonwealth country, I would tell you that there's the British model as an alternative model for an end of authoritarianism. It takes a very long time. It started with 1066, you had Henry VIII, you had Cromwell, you had Thomas Paine, The Rights of Man. You had the Charters, and it went, it's, been, it's still ongoing. And that is the kind of scenario, a rather slow process of democratization that's a common combination of top-down pressure with adjustments on the regime at the top is actually a scenario that I imagined for China. And the, some of the descriptions that you portray collectively, at diff not all of you at all the time, but some of your versions of China, I don't really recognize. And I spend a lot of time in China and talk to a lot of Chinese people. 
And I would say that um, one, one further comment is that there are, diff there are multiple Chinas when it comes to repression and the experience of people in Lhasa or in the Tibetan parts of Sichuan or in um, the Uyghur parts of Xinjiang versus the construction core, the paradise of uh, Shi for example, is a very different story um, from people living in villages near Kashgar. They experience China very, very differently. And those people that I'm talking about who experience the, that extreme for, form of repression or control, they're, as one other speaker mentioned, they're a minority. So the majority of people in China experience Kung Guan, uh, it, macro management approach, and that's what the party calls it. They don't use control except in extreme measures. So um, I, I think that there are other scenarios for China, and we shouldn't neglect the British model. Thank you all for those very good questions. We'll have to wrap up now. Why don't we do it in reverse order of the original uh, speakers, choose the questions you want to address. We'll do Louisa and Minchin and Andy. All right, just very selectively, uh, what Americans can do other than criticize openly. Uh, it doesn't sound like you're suggesting that Americans should not speak up on behalf of uh, universal values and people whose human rights are uh, violated. The Center for American Progress, uh, a think tank you must know well, uh, issued a report about how the then incoming or upcoming new administration of the uh, Democratic president, President Obama, could uh, make progress on human rights without being confrontational. So I refer you to that. Um, easier said than done. Then uh, on the fifth scenario, um, absolutely. I, I, you're, thank you very much. It's really much more uh, clear than the point I've been trying to make, which is to say the only hope of change is instability or pressure such that this particular party, no matter how resilient uh, and uh, with what kind of ability to renew itself, um, you know, until it can no longer hold on, that's the only way change will happen. And certainly, if we look at the changes that preceded Tiananmen and then even the last 25 years, and remember, this is 25 years. If you look at from Charter 77 to 1989, um, you know, that was only 12 years. If you look at Prague Spring to 89, it was 21 years. We're now at 25 years from Tiananmen, and some things, uh, you know, overall, there are better institutions and there are better prospects for good governance and democracy, and other things you get. Uh, Trends that go up and down uh, all the time. But I actually, I, I agree this fifth scenario is the best hope. And this is why NED does support liberal intellectuals and people who are doing legal reform and those who are trying to uphold, you know, but we don't want to give up our standard that, uh, you know, people should be treated without discrimination, despite the fact that everywhere in our society, actually, people have to pay bribes and they are discriminated against. And they know that if you're disabled, you know, forget it unless you're rich. And, you know, and certainly, uh, you know, you have to be in the elite and have official power if you really want to have complete freedom or else make a lot of money, in which case you have to make deals with people who use their official discretion in a way that everybody knows is not according to what, how upright officials and people who are following, you know, good governance standards are following. So people know there's rot in the system. They do get along. People try to find their own lives. And there is a narrow path negotiating that kind of path with the right kind of pressure from below from dissatisfaction from the side from intellectuals who are trying to articulate what a good system would be like, trying to study abroad and so on. So the institutional reform efforts that people are making, there's some kind of path that might possibly be constructed, but I think it's just very precarious and difficult, as is the construction of any democracy. But does it take centuries? I won't. <laughs> I'm refusing to give my 15 years versus uh, 1,500 years. I don't have an answer. Uh, I'll say something on the Chinese economy. The consensus is that a slowdown is inevitable. What people do not agree on is the extent of the slowdown. Is it going to be as low as 4%, 3%, 7%, an economy growing at 7%, an economy growing at 3%, a completely two different economies, and the political consequences are very different, so that's one. Uh, and then is that even to maintain mil medium uh, level growth, we're talking about 5%, China still needs to take very difficult, uh, undertake very difficult economic reforms. And these 
reforms have been outlined in, on paper, but how they're going to be implemented, again, is an unknown uh, uh, factor. So in other words, uh, when we look ahead, one thing that is clear is that performance-based legitimacy is going to erode as economic reform, uh, as economic performance deteriorates. Uh, regarding American role, I would say uh, probably I would increase NED funding, <laughs> but uh, try to educate American politicians to be a little bit more sens sensitive or tactical when they raise, when they say things on certain issues. Territorial disputes probably should be a little bit more careful because these things can backfire. Uh, other things I, I think they should be as forthcoming as, as they can. Okay. <clears throat> I'm gonna try to wrap, uh, make a comment that would answer, uh, that would address, uh, not totally answer, but would take, say something about Anne Marie's uh, question and Jerry's question and uh, and Yashua's uh, comment, which is to say, Xi Jinping recently visited Europe and gave a number of speeches, and one of them he gave at UNESCO is in Geneva, right? UNESCO, and he said, oh, Paris. Paris, okay, and he said, uh, uh, and his um, his theme was that all. Uh, that the world is made of many different civilizations and each civilization has its own values and all of these value systems are equally valid and valuable. And so what he was arguing for is, you know, cultural relativism. And the speech is a s symptom of the fact that China, China's system is under attack uh, and, it, and it's not consistent with universal values, what they call universal values, and so they reject the concept of universal values. And so my answer basically to Anne-Marie, why it, it doesn't take 1,500 years is because we now live in the modern age of globe. Oh, sorry, only 1,000. Uh, what did you say? 150 years. Anyway, 1066. oh, I see. I got the fit number start, from sorry. her. She my confused math. me. Uh, but my point is, we, we live in a different age from that of Henry VIII, maybe unfortunately. And, and we live in the age of globalization in which there is this pervasive view in the world, right or wrong, that democracy is the normative system, and even the 60 points refer to democracy. So, uh, so the system is under... Uh, under attack. Now, Jerry's question is, why is that? You know, since the American system performs even worse than the Chinese system, why isn't our system also under attack or even more so under attack? Which by some people it is, by the way, of course. There's this discourse, Martin Jakes and uh, Stefan Helper and, you know, who else, you know, saying basically, you know, we should adopt the Chinese system uh, because it works better. But I think uh, it works differently, and the way it works differently, I would come back to what Zhao Hui sent. Was that, was that a WeChat that he sent to you? Uh, is a tweet, okay, old-fashioned technology from last year. Okay, so we do have this article in here where he's one of the three contributors. Um, uh, but his point, I think, is that <clears throat> that the Chinese system is brittle. Was that the term that he used? You know, which is to say, well, what does he mean by that? He probably means that the uh, the way in which the Chinese system resolves all of these complicated social conflicts that it tries to deal with is not not perceived as fair. I agree with Anne Marie that most people don't go to court. Most people don't get arrested by the political police and they go about their business. But I think most Chinese know that if you get in some kind of trouble and have a conflict, uh, that the system is unfair in some very fundamental way where we think our system you know, may misfire, but that it's fundamentally fair. We think maybe we're living in a false consciousness. So I think that's the difference. Let me thank uh, our panelists. I hope please join in in giving them a round of applause. <laughs> thank you all for coming. And those of you who are interested in the book, unless we've sold out, 
uh, we still should have copies in the back. 